Well, listen, why don't we start? Um, uh, thank you, um, everyone who's joined us. I, I can't see you all. Um, there's probably a button I can press where I get some names and, and thank you for joining, but I will do that at the end because I can't see where that button is. But um, as importantly, I'd lo obviously love to say um, thank you to Paul Nichols for joining us for our end of season finale and Francesca Kamani for joining in as well and, and starting this conversation with um, Paul. Um, I'd like to say particular thanks as well to JM Finn, who are the um, wealth management business who very kindly partner up with us and um, help us put these things together. And also the team behind Old Gold Racing who, who put the tech together and put the advertisements together and, and everything. And also to all you guys sitting at home watching this, because it's gonna be a fun evening. Um, we're gonna do this, we're gonna run this for about an hour um, and it'll work like this. So more thank yous coming. We're gonna to talk to um, Paul uh, uh, now for, for about 20 minutes. Um, Frances is gonna have a chat with him, got a bunch of questions. We'll answer any questions that, along the way um, that we get in if we possibly can. Um, then at about 7.40, Harry Derham, who as many of you obviously know is Paul's assistant trainer and nephew is gonna come in and, and join and probably you know burst the balloon. Uh, um, and then um, at about 7.55, so about um, 15 minutes later, Ruby Walsh is gonna come in and join over from Ireland and talk about um, the various uh, um, um, things that he got involved in as Steve Dockey to ditch it, just when things really got, you know, ramped up and things got very excited, exciting rather. So um, thank you, Francesca, thank you, Paul, in advance, thank you, Harry and Ruby. Um, thank you everyone who's watching. I'm going to disappear now and become a sort of block with probably just my name there. Um, and I'll come and join you at the end and say um, my fond farewell. So good luck, everyone, and enjoy yourselves. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Ed Seifrey, there, yeah. our chief executive <clears throat> from the Old Gold Racing headquarters. Uh, Paul Nichols is joining us from home, I think. Paul Nichols, you're very smart background then. Meanwhile, I'm in a hotel just down the road from Sandown where we are uh, doing the racing tomorrow, flat day to tomorrow, jumps finale on Saturday. And Paul, really, I just wanted to start by saying congratulations, 12th uh, trainer's title. That is really some achievement. And with your biggest number of winners beating your own record, what is it, 173 now with a 25% strike rate. How will you look back on this season? Well, yeah, it's been amazing, really frustrating to start with because we obviously lost the first two months of the season in May and, and June. So we only have had a 10 month season, really, as opposed to 12. And, you know, with all the COVID and everything that was going on, you didn't really know how, the th how things were going to pan out with owners and how many people would stay in the game and how much season there would be. But thankfully, racing kept going all the way through I and mean, everyone worked hard to make sure it was safe and good. And then we've ended up with one of the most amazing seasons so far, 173 winners. Um, as you say, a great straight, strike rate, plenty of prize money, you know, considering it's so, you know, been knocked about with COVID. I think we've had 2.3 million prize money this season, which would have been rocking on probably 3 million if it hadn't been for the COVID restrictions and the, the drop of prize money. And just been a phenomenal season from the start, you know, lots of big winners, um, lots of horses running very well. And, you know, as you said, a 12th tra uh, uh, trainers championship. It's a massive achievement. Well done to you and all the team there at Ditch It. And then you mentioned the subject of prize money. Again, amazing to have amassed that much in a year where the prize money levels have been so affected by COVID. There's actually a really good discussion uh, between you and Richard Hoyles and actually Ruby Walsh is also in that on the ITV Racing podcast. So if you want to get more into that conversation, Go and check that out. But here we're really going to talk a bit more about Paul Nichols, the man, because for the people who might be relatively new to racing, old gold racing members who haven't been in the game that long, uh, I think we should just take it back to the start. Mm. And uh, old gold racing PR, head of PR, Hannah Walker, has helped me with today with a bit of a running order. And she's given me some suggested questions. The first one being, who is Paul Nichols? Which I think is a pretty big, pretty deep question. But... Over to you, Paul. Um, well, probably, um, I probably, I came from a non-racing background. Uh, my father was in the police force. My grandfather was in the police force. No involvement with horses whatsoever. Um, so that was not a likely start to be champion trainer, I suppose. Um, 
but I, for some reason, my dad and I got hooked on ponies. Uh, dad bought me a pony, did all the normal. I got hooked on the on that Jim Canners and to, you know the venting pony club, anything to do with pony club hunting, whatever. I just became fascinated with the horses. And my granddad actually, it was called Frank, was was a uh, loved gambling. And every Saturday, I used to go around to his and watch the ITV Seven um, and have a little bet. And we used to. Um, have a bet over a crunchy and I always used to back everything Richard Pittman used to ride it and actually called Richard Crunchy Pittman because I always <laughs> used to crunch your granddad and granddad got me hooked on, on on the racing and that tied in with the ponies I sort of kept saying to dad oh I love this I want to be a jockey one day those days I, I was quite small and light and different to what I am now and it was just something I, I, I thought I wanted to do and for whatever reason we followed down their normal route dad got me a point to pointer and I used to work for a guy called Dick Bainbridge, who's sadly just died recently. He was one of the best trainers of a racehorse you'd ever come across, especially point to pointers. His rep with point to pointers was brilliant. And I spent five or six years with him and learned an awful lot about everything to do with horses. And, and the one thing that struck me was fitness. You know, the horses were, his horses were fit, mega fit. And I just, I, I just got hooked on racing and, it was a start for me, really, by being with him, point to pointing, hunting, and all the normal stuff you do as a pony club kid, really. And I know Hannah is a good friend of yours, but the next question did make me laugh. I promise I'm not going to read her mm. questions mm. word for word. But did he rate himself as a jockey? Well, I always used to say that, as I said, her dad was a policeman. I thought I always used to ride like a policeman, but <laughs> I, I was quite tall and ungainly. Probably didn't look that stylish, but I suppose I was effective and I used to think things through. I think that's one of the most important things is you can think things through, think about the tactics. I mean, I was lucky enough to ride, I think I rode about 130 winners over an eight-year period and won the Hennessy Gold Cup twice, the Welsh Grand National Irish Gold Cup. So I rode some good winners, but as you can imagine, I struggled with my weight, really, and it was quite an effort to ride anything under 11 stone, even in those days. So it restricted me as to what I... I ended up through my ride. I knew if I was going to get into racing and train with it, I had to sort of get involved in racing because I had no connections with anybody. So riding for five or six or seven years, I, I rode for Les Kennard and Josh Gifford. For, I worked there for Josh's part of it and ended up with David Barron. So I, I've got... I don't know if this is my Wi-Fi having issues or Paul's, but I'm suddenly not really working. Or Paul's not working. I'm sure he'll be right onto it in a second. Oh, you can hear me. Well, that's good news. Um, I'm really enjoying hearing Paul Nichols's story because I've jumped back in. Oh, see. there we go. <laughs> we, were in, we were in full flow, Paul. We were really enjoying. Um, We've got you back, but you're muted. Story. How's that? Better? Perfect. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> Wi-Fi went down somewhere. So I basically had a bad accident, packed up riding, and was assistant trainer to um, David Barons for um, a number of years. And we won the Grand National with Seagram in 1991. And that really got me hooked on training and wanting to do it myself. It's great to hear that because there is a bit of a myth, isn't there, in racing that you have to have been born in a racing family yeah. or have, have many connections to it. But the fact that you really worked your way up firstly through the riding ranks and then um, being assistant trainer is all the more credit to you. So talk to me about when you started training, why did you choose Ditch It as a base? Well, I, I didn't have anywhere to go, to be honest with you. And I, I was seriously struggling to find somewhere to, to start training. And I knew Paul Barber, funny enough. I'd written a winner for him. And I knew Richard Barber. I'd written some point to pointers for him. And one day, in, I think it was about a month after Seagram had won the national, and I decided I was going to leave David and Jenny and do my own thing. But I didn't know where. There was an advert in the Racing Post. Um, sent small yard in, in Ditch in Somerset. 20 boxes available. Successful applicant will have the support of the landlord. I didn't actually know it was Paul Barber at the time, but I rang up straight away and he basically said, what kept you? I was waiting for your call. And it was just like 7.30 in the morning. So we'd arranged for me to go up and see Paul the next day on the Sunday. And I somehow or another convinced him that I was going to make a success of training horses. And he must have liked what he heard and the rest is history, really. What was it like in the early days? 
Well, I had eight horses when I started. I had £10,000 in my pocket that I learned from riding that put into the business. So I started it off with £10,000 and eight horses and had to make it work. And I remember Paul was very kind to me. He, he let me off the rent for the first six months I was there to help me, which I eventually paid back when I got up and running. That was a massive plus. Um, eight horses. First year managed to train, I think, nine or ten winners. And slowly started to creep it up from there. And um, it's just like anything we can uh, just ex- Well, I think when I started, there was 20 boxes. And we've now got 160 boxes in, in the two yards and ditch it. And there was just one all-weather all gallop up a hill when I, was, I started and now we got forward to it. I mean, it's just the amount of investment we put into it. As, so as I've been successful, I've played everything back into the business to make it successful and make it what it is and a lot of support from a lot of people. And the main thing is, Francesca, is a training winners. If you train winners, you've got to be successful. And I, I struggled, well, not struggled, every year on year I did okay. It was eight winners, then it was 15 and crept on up. And I, of course, you need Cheltenham winners to to um, get noted, really. And in 19... 99 it was um i managed on the first day of the festival to win the arco with flagship uberalis which is my first ever Cheltenham winner so we thought that was fantastic the second day we won the champion chase we called equine and we just couldn't believe our luck and then on the third day seymour business won the gold cup so you can imagine never having had a Cheltenham winner we've seen the th- had three in a week and that was the start of everything it you know those like three that. horses made me but yeah the moment they really put you on the map yeah. what would your 25, 30 year old self back then uh, with your 10 grand in your pocket and eight mm. horses have said to mm. you being tra- crowned 12 times champion trainer now, would you have believed it? No, of course you don't because you you, 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 you know, you always have ambition. I was always very ambitious, but I never ever dreamt I'd be champion trainer or ever dreamt to have the success we've had. But, you know, it just came as, as things snowboard as you, you get better and, and, you know, you get better horses and you train more winners and, I've just been incredibly lucky to have the support of so many people. You can't do it on your own. You need good people around you, good owners, good family, um, and good horses. And I've been incredibly lucky that it's all fell into place. And then, you know, yeah, lucky, who comes along? Corto Star, Denman, Big Bucks, Masterminded, Neptune Colange. We just, I just got very lucky. We had an incredible bunch of horses. It just made the whole thing for us. I want to touch more on those big name horses a little bit later on, but where are you now? I mean, happy birthday for last week, 59 mm. years mm. old, 12 time champion trainer. You won all the, all the big races that there are to win. What motivates you to still get up in the morning and keep training winners? Well, winners and training nice horses. Um, you know, in, uh, just love it really. It's just, you know, we got some beautiful young horses for the future. Um, and, and and just training those big winners and as you said, being champion helps. It's not the be all and end all, but it, it, it obviously is it's an ambition every year to try and do that. But it's also to be successful with the horses you've got, the people that work for you. I get so much pleasure seeing Harry Cobden do so well, you know, from from, from you know, yet relatively young man. He's trained a hundred he's written a hundred hundred winners for me this year, and hundred and twenty five I think in total. Brian's success and all the success of those young people are, I'm sort of really proud of but um, it, I think it's just the whole game I love it it's just, just buzzing I'm, I can't wait now for, for Chepstow to start next season in October we're already planning for that and um, you know just it's just a great game and I love it well, We're going to have a poll a little bit later on about who were the uh, best Paul Nichols jockeys past and present and also who were uh, the greatest horses mm-hmm. that you've trained. So I want everyone to, to get involved in our polls a little bit later. But hearing you talking about next season already makes me think, do you ever take a break? How do you recharge? Well, you don't. You, I mean, time from now onwards, actually, from Saturday onwards, right through to October, it, there's not so much pressure. We're not going to be so busy, not so many runners. It's not so intense. But there's still loads to do, you know, buying and selling horses, maintaining the gallops disinfecting all the stables, giving them a break, painting, cleaning. It's so much to go on. Um, it never really stops. I do tend to get a bit bored in that time of year because we're not so busy. Like, you know, every day at the moment you go and racing and making decisions and planning and talking to people. But I usually try and have a break in January. I like working hard up till sort of Christmas and then I'm 10 days in the Caribbean if I can. Might sound very grand, but that actually does me good. It recharges the battery for the second half of the season and then on to go because you don't get a day off. I mean, it is literally 24-7, as you know, with your dad, you know, 24-7, seven days a week. There's no time for a day off and no time to sit back. You have to be intense. 
So a little break in January is good. That's when I enjoy it most to have a break. It was fascinating when we paid a visit um, with Old Gold Racing to your yard, what was it, back in September last year. Magnificent facilities and all spread out through the different parts of the, of the village. And that gallop that literally just goes <laughs> what seemed to be kind of vertical uphill. You talk about fit horses, that... That must really get them fit. I was lucky enough to ride Present Man, who's a, a two-time winner of the Badger Ales at Wing Canton. Meanwhile, we also have a bit of Badger Ales. So thank you very much uh, to them, to Mark and Tess Woodhouse for, for sending these. And it's very much a, a local favourite track of yours, isn't it? Uh, Wing Canton's a great track, obviously. Um, it's 20 minutes from here. They have some fantastic races. I've been lucky. I think I've won the Badger Ales chase. I'm not sure. It's not far off 10 times, probably. And I think three or four times from Mark and Tessa Woodhouse, who actually own, you know, the brewery. And so it's a great race for them. But, um, yeah, I love Wing Canton. It's, it's a super course. Gets a lot of support. And it, it'll be good next year to get back to getting people back in there and get back to normal. And there are some other races that have, that have become almost, you know, Paul Nichols' uh, owned races in a way because the King George, the sixth chase. How many, how many times have you won that? 12. It was the 12th time this year with um, with Frodon. So that's an amazing... It, I love that race. It's just like the most awesome race. He's been so lucky for us. And, uh, you know, 12 is an incredible number to win. So have been very lucky to have the right horses that can do that job. And we sort of tend to target them for it. And before we and bring... I think the Tingle Creek's been a race. I, I, I... Sorry. Carry on. No, carry on. No, I was going to say, before we bring... Um... Harry Derriman, just a quick like overview of the season. Again, you were talking at the beginning about the number of winners, mm. um, 25% strike rate, super high on quality. Where do you think you were in terms of quality? Um, obviously, Cheltenham, first time in a long time you haven't had a winner. How do you yeah. imagine that? Well, I mean, it's, it's about having the right horses for the festival races. And I, and I was wondering sort of after Christmas whether we might struggle a bit with the grade one races because obviously we weren't going to run Mon Morale. The owners weren't keen. They wanted to wait for entry. Clanders about, we knew it was, a, it was no good to go to Cheltenham. Brave Man's Game obviously won the Chalo at Christmas. It was a grade one, had a, a shout. He ran very well at Cheltenham. Wasn't quite good enough to win. Um, but a lot of the, our handicappers tend to be exposed by the time they get to Cheltenham. I never shy running them. I don't actually set them back to go to Cheltenham. So a lot of them, we run in handicaps, are pretty well exposed. They had a bit of bad luck as well, like the little log had that bleed before the champion chase. And argue you could say on his best form, he may have taken some beating. And um, Bob and Co was going very well in the Fox Hunters when he fell at the third last. And it's just how it goes. And you know, we made up for it at, at, at entry. But you, it's like a football team. You always want to have those good players in your team. And you can only deal with the, the team and the players you've got at any one time. And at each end of each year, you will put some on the transfer list, as I say, and we keep buying some in. And we're always trying to increase the quality of the, the players. So, yeah, lots of good winners, lots of great ones. But, you know, we, we just need to keep improving the quality to get back to having those good horses. And what Very do you make good of horses, the whole... really. Not good horses. We've got plenty of good horses. What do you make of the whole England, England versus Ireland head-to-head uh, -head with their domination at Cheltenham? Well, it, it goes in, in circles, you know, back in when I was having all those winners with all those good horses, I think the English were winning all the races. And I think they were wondering what, how I ended up with getting all those, you know, when one festival, we won nearly all the big races. It just goes in cycles. And at the moment, I think they've probably got the, the buying power and they've got the, the best players. And it, it'll, it'll all come back. It just goes in cycles. And, you know, lots made of it. I mean, um, I look at the season in this country as a 52-week, 24-7 job and you've got to try and get the best out of the team that you have to play with at any one time and that's what we try and do is win as many races as we can and when the good ones are good enough to run at Cheltenham they're good enough to to win you know we, we had a lot of good horses go to Ireland when we had the right ones it's a matter of having the right players for the right time yeah and good luck and it'll, with, it'll come back it'll come back good luck with uh, Clanders over Punchestown also with Frodo on, on Saturday really looking forward to seeing both, <clears throat> both of them running not only are you uh, a master trainer of horses, but you're also a pretty good trainer of assistant trainers. Uh, Dan Skelton, of course, being one of the best examples. Uh, can we welcome in Harry Derham, your current uh, assistant trainer and your nephew? Ah, oh, there we are. Hey, Harry. <laughs> hey. Uh, just to position you guys around Ditch It, like where, where are you exactly? Are you just down the road from Paul's? Is this, are, you, are you at home right now? As the... Um, crow flies from Paul's house I'm probably 
what, four or five hundred yards, I guess. So not far at all. Is that where you grew up? No, I grew up about uh, an hour and a half from here, uh, just north of Bristol. Uh, but then I, um, mum and dad, I had a deal with mum and dad that as long as I did all my GCSEs, then I could, I could come and do what I wanted to do. So that was that was that. And what was it like growing up as Paul Nichols's nephew? Um, I don't know really. I suppose I never thought about it. To be honest with you, it was just, it was, it was, it was a good thing to do on the weekends to go and watch all his horses win most of the big races with Ruby riding them. Um, that's why that's why I got into racing. I, I've always said that that the reason I got into racing is because on a Saturday morning I go and ride my pony and then get get in the car with Dad and go and watch Paul and Ruby just basically win everything. Um, I thought oh, I I like a bit of this. I have a bit of this. So that's that's what got me involved. So GCSE's done and straight to ditch it. Yeah, so rode a little bit of point to pointing uh, whilst I was doing my GCSEs, and then uh, on I remember I got the phone call from the the, the lady at school was going to open my results for me, and uh, I got the phone call from her before I was riding out third lot um, at balls, and she said, "Yeah, you you've passed all of them." So quickly rang mum and said, "Mum, I've passed all of them." And I think. Unlike most mothers, she was probably a little bit disappointed that I had, um, because then that meant I could go and do what I wanted to do. So um, I think that was um, that was in the summer. I had my first ride um, for Paul that season in September at Newton Abbott on a horse called Earth Planet, finished second. Um, and yeah, and then it, it went from there. Really, was it a how? What kind of length was the riding career? Uh, three years. Fairly, fairly uneventful, fairly unexciting. Um, definitely found my found my calling there. Yeah. So training, you've set your sights on training. This is year what now in partnership? Well, in, as assistant to Paul. I'm I'm two days off being assistant for five years with Paul. So um, yeah, I've I've I feel like I I think for the first two years I was probably about as much use as a chocolate teapot. Um, <laughs> And I feel like I'm just about becoming helpful now. It's it's a role that takes time to get into because you know there's no there's no set day as it were. Um, you know, Paul Paul gives you enough rope to go and um, you know make your own mistakes and 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 learn plenty. And if you if you get things wrong, you'll know about it fairly sharply. But you you're never strangled. Um, and so I feel like the last, to be honest with you. I've, I feel like the last six months I've sort of found my groove doing it and um, hopefully I'm just about becoming useful now. Paul, how does he compare with the assistants gone by? <laughs> Don't compare me to Dan, I've got no hope. <laughs> and obviously, yeah, you, 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 no, you're comparing them with Dan. I mean, it's funny, Harry says it took take, takes him a while to set into it. I mean, Dan was here nine years. I think the first four years he struggled. I mean, he, he, had, he was... He could hardly keep up with Clifford and I most of the time. And, you know, he's very intense and a lot of pressure, a lot of work. You know, you don't get a lot of time off. And it just takes a lot of getting in. You know, it's a big thing. And, you know, as Harry said, it's taken him four or five years. You know, the first, he's been here five years now. It's took a couple of years, which you really uh, just sit back and, and look and learn and listen. And then as you do more and more, you get more and more experience. And the easier he finds it, and he's probably found this last year, probably the easiest of all he knows what's going on now and I can leave him to do stuff and yeah it's it's it, following the same route as Dan to be honest with you and Harry and Paul cited fitness as being one of the key things the key secrets to his success what do you think it is uh, that makes the Paul Nichols so stable so strong um yeah f- fitness is a huge part um but the to me Paul's um of <laughs> A bit awkward saying it in front of him, but like Paul is an absolute wizard at putting horses in the right races. Like the system, if Paul has to be in the office for a morning or he has to, you know, be in London or, or, or whatever it is, the system of of um, of work and the training doesn't it doesn't take care of itself. It takes a lot of organising. But you know, there's a good team of people that know what the horse is doing on, on a day to day basis, and and but the 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 genius of Paul is is all of a sudden a horse will you'll be thinking God what are we going to do with him and all of a sudden he's one of three and I, there's countless examples over the last five years that I'd be thinking I'm not sure I'm not sure how he's going to win with this and the next thing 
he, you've gone on one three and you're thinking, God, he's actually quite a nice horse. So that that's where that's I'm sure where Paul's genius is a lot. You know, he has his horses very fit, yes, and they're very healthy, and there's a balance between they're not um, they're not over galloped, but they're they are fit and they they have longevity. But the 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 reason I think that he is so successful is because he thinks that there is a race for every horse and, and there's a lot of horses that should not have won as many races they have that have come out of picture. And uh, I heard Paul being asked on a, uh, on a podcast recently about um, succession plans and we've seen uh, how training partnerships have become more and more popular. John and Thady Gosden going down that there's no point. There's no point in saying it. I'd say Paul's the most ambitious man in the world. There's more <laughs> chance of him giving up in the next 10 years. I'm more likely to fly to the moon. <laughs> I don't think Richard Hall's even finished the question and there was a no. There is a very... Um, uh, Paul is unapologetic in the... Um, way that he wants to try and be the greatest national trainer of all time winners wise and um why would you share it with a little upstart like me um he's you know he's if he didn't train another winner now he'd be one of the best of all time and 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 why would you you know if he wants to keep doing that i i'm i'm, I'm fully understanding of that and what what will that um what will make you the the best national trainer of all time Paul is it is it number of winners overall is it training championships is it Cheltenham Aintree what is it I don't think anyone's ever trained 4,000 jump winners I, I'm not I'm, I'm, I'm not I, I'm I might be slightly wrong I'm sure Martin Pipe trained if I'm right 3,900 or something like that close to 4,000 and I might have got the figures wrong but I don't think anyone's trained 4,000 jump winners I'd like to do that I think we're on about 3,000 nearly 3,300 or 3,200 and something or whatever. It's that sort of figure. It'll take a few more years yet, but at our current rate, not quite as long as possible. But I'd love to train 4,000 winners. That's the target I've got. And you know, Martin was champion trainers 15 times, I think it was. So if we're going to beat his record of that, it means uh, winning another four titles. Well, that won't be so easy because I know Dan Scowell's got that in his sight. So we're <laughs> going to have a few battles with him over the next few years. So those next four might be incredibly hard. But, um, you know, to train 4,000 winners would be great. And I, I've got no intention of backing down. I, I'm as fit and healthy. I love the game. And, you know, I, don't, I, I have the knack of not getting tired and being able to keep the enthusiasm up. And I just, as I said to you earlier, I feel we've only just started. And to be honest with you, all the experience Clifford and myself have got and the facilities were probably the best place. We, we are probably in the best position to be able to do the best we've ever been able to do so. So there's no intention of dropping back at all. I think if you could bottle some of the energy that you've got and sell it, it would it would make a lot of money. Um, but you'll also have to look out for maybe young Harry Derham on your on your tail in terms of trainer championships. And Harry, I hope you're saving your pennies to go and buy your own place because you're definitely not going into a training <laughs> partnership. And Paul's got three daughters who are in exactly. line for you. Olive, Olive is, I think, eleven years younger. Than me. She's, she's, al she's, al she's already a better rider than me knows more about training than me and probably probably keener than me as well so i'm well down the pecking order <laughs> no, but go, going back going back to harry i mean the experience he's getting is like dan it's invaluable and you know if, wherever it's, he trains one day whether it's here in the future or whether he goes off on his own and you know a super opportunity might come up from because if ever there was an opportunity someone looking for someone to train one day he'd be top of the list in my book so what he's gaining now all that experience all the time with us we're standing in good stead wherever he goes um, I'll just go on to one thing that JP said to me uh, once about Dan Skelton and some <laughs> Harry Fry and some of the lads. He said to me, well, lad, you've learned your lesson. He said, treat them well, teach them well, but don't teach them everything you know. And that <laughs> made me laugh. And he's probably right. But, I, I, you know, the lads are here with me with Dan and Harry and Anthony Honeyball, Sam Thomas, and a, a lot of really good lads have started. I, I, I enjoy sharing everything that we do here with them. I've got no secrets. And, you know, if, I, if Dan's champion trainer one day or Harrod's champion trainer one day, I'll be very, very proud of them. Yeah, there's a lovely atmosphere uh, around the yard. And obviously, a lot of you seem to socialise together and enjoy mm. each other's company. That's a really nice um, nice team bond that you've got going on. Um, we're going to introduce uh, Ruby to the chat relatively soon. But before that, I think we should have our poll. We can put up the details of the poll. 
And the question is, who do you consider could be Paul's best stable jockey? Um, both. Paul that's not a. Que- that's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> It's not a question. Because <laughs> there's such a clear uh, Harry, you might have got one vote from your mum. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe the only person that would not say Ruby Walsh is my granddad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think we might get a, a list of who's um, who's on the list. Come on, Paul, but while we're waiting for it, run us through the top stable jockeys you've had. Well, I mean, Ruby was the most successful, obviously, and we had a great relationship for a for a good number of years and you know some fantastic winners but you know Daryl Jacob I was incredibly fond of Daryl Jacob he did incredibly well for us and he still rides your run for us now uh, Sam Twiston Davis you know he he did very well Harry Cobden I think he, he could be as good as any of them you know given the time you know he gets a bit more experience Lucky Brian he's been one of the best girl jockeys you know to win for us um, Timmy Murphy rode for us and when he was at his best he was absolutely brilliant you know, we've re- had some really good jockeys over the years, but I would say without a doubt, Ruby's probably been the most successful and, and, and rode the most big winners. And, you know, we had a great relationship. So I think everyone at home, uh, you have those jockeys to choose from. So start giving us your your answers. Um, I'll give one. Oh, here we go. Here we oh, go. I'm going to vote. I'm going to vote. Oh, I can't vote. I'm a panellist. Joe, oh. yeah. <laughs> oh, well. Joe, Joe know, rode I... a lot of winners as well. Uh, here we go. Okay, Harry Durham, you made the list. Look. Well, I wasn't a yeah. stable jockey. <laughs> <laughs> no. We put you on anyway. Like, Paul, Paul wouldn't have had nearly as many winners if he had me a stable jockey. He'd been in all kinds of trouble. <laughs> yeah. To be fair, Joe Tizard, Joe Tizard wrote a lot of winners at the start. He did very well. Okay. So it sounds like, by the sound of what you guys are saying, yeah. that it's going to be a pretty clear-cut thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. With Let's Ruby coming out on top. We'll have the results of that poll. Um, a little bit later, but I think probably on that on that note, should we welcome him in? Ruby, are you there? Kind of like I walk the like I walk the technology, Francesca. I'd be in. <laughs> there we oh, are. The really. results are up. The results. I mean, look at that. What a what a what a time to welcome you back in, Ruby. I'm not sure if you can see the screen at the moment. Mm, I can. I can see you, and I can see Harry Darman, Paul Nichols. Am I supposed to be looking for something else? Can you see the poll? No. Oh, you can't see the poll. Well, yeah. Ruby got sixty-eight percent. You're about you're, you're, well. a, you're about a ten to one on shot, Ruby. So I shouldn't worry. <laughs> I got beaten. A few, I got beaten a few of those, Harry, when I was riding the poll as well. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Twist and Davis to be mortified. He got one percent of the vote, one percent less than Harry Cobden. I mean, look how many and Harry Durham. Durham. That's terrible. I think Harry's <laughs> mum's been voting. <laughs> It's funny how it's funny enough, yeah. Paolo. I got sixty eight percent of the vote, but when you got a real jockey, you trade more winners than you ever did. <laughs> oh, there we are, yeah. <laughs> we had the class one, Joe. Um, thank you for joining us, Ruby. How's Love, that? Francesca. Life is lovely in Ireland, the sun is shining, it's a uh, very spring day and uh, yeah, it's great. A bit of sunshine is nice, I must say. Mind you, if I was still riding, I'd be giving out the sun was shining. The water and punches down flat to the board, sand down would probably be quick and I'd be giving out like stink, but now that I'm not riding anymore, I rather enjoy the sunshine. And Ruby, my first question to you is, is there anything that you don't do well? Not only were you a superstar in the saddle and now in your new role as a, as a TV analyst, pundit, you're setting a whole new standard in that role. Are you a perfectionist in everything that you do? I don't know about that. Um, no, I look... Um, Thank you for doing something, Francesca. You have to try and do it as well as you, as you possibly can. But I don't know. Um, I, I suppose I do um, TV a little different. I probably do what other people don't, and that's analyse replays. Um, most other people are interested in what's going to happen. I prefer talking about what's after happening, which is probably a lot easier than trying to predict the future if you can talk about what's already happened. So um, it's a different way of doing it, but I enjoy it. Which I imagine you did a lot when you were riding, looking back at, at your rides and seeing what you could have done better or differently. But uh, what kind of, how different is it this role as a as a TV pundit to being a jockey? I mean, obviously it's the same kind of subject, but very different skill set. It, it is. Um, that's your dinner ready, yeah? Coming out of the microwave. Um, yeah, mail, brilliant. <laughs> um, ah, look, it is very different. Look, nothing it, it would ever replace, ever replace riding, but. Um, I probably had a, 
had had enough of riding by the time I, I stopped. So I was looking forward to something new. I had, I had a great time as a jockey, but I, I do enjoy it. And um, look, I was a I was a national hunt jockey. I wasn't a Premier League footballer, so I'm still going to have to work for a living. <laughs> oh, let's get our little violins out. Um, <laughs> but Ruby, uh, tell me about the partnership with Paul. Uh, how did it start? Um, and what was it like being based in Ireland, yet also being main jockey for a big stable in England? Yeah, it kind of probably came about at a bit of a, 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 a not a difficult time, but at a crossroads time for me. Um, it was obviously through a connection through Paul Barber. Um, my dad had trained for Paul Barber many years uh, when Jim Old was actually in Ditch Heat. Um, and then Paul Nichols obviously took over. But I, I, my memory is it came, through, came about through Paul Barber. I could be wrong. Um, and maybe Rob, Sir Robert Ogden. But um, look, I was kind of, had committed to a couple of jobs in Ireland. Um, Paul was looking for a jockey and we kind of more came to an agreement, Paul, than me taking the job. It was, yeah. I was available to ride Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. Um, but I'd be in Ireland Thursdays and Sundays and that's how it kind of started. And I don't think I ever took the job. Paul never gave me the job. We just kind of went about it that way and, and that's how it started, Francesca. And lots of toing and froing between the two countries. And, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I have a fairly large uh, gap in national hunt knowledge because I was in Australia for most of the last 12 winters. So just looking at like the careers of AP and yourself, why was there such a uh, a need to come to England where now the, the, the best jump jockeys mostly stay in Ireland? Because at the time, the best horses were in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that was as simple as that. And that's a cyclical thing. So I guess I followed them. And um, when I went to work for Paul, as Ertiup was the first real good horse that we had together. Um, see, my business was just coming to an end. I was lucky enough to win on him and win Canton one day. I don't even know if that race is still there, Paul, is it? Country Gentleman's Chase? No, it's not. Chase, no, it's not no, it's no, gone. No, no, it's gone. Yeah. Um, but that was a great race. It was, yeah. And I won on see my business and win Canton. He then went to the Gold Cup. But uh, Zertiup was the first good horse we had together. And then I ended up leading Ryder in Cheltenham. I rode three winners for Paul uh, the following year. Zertiup won the champion chase. Sparazim won the county hurdle, St. Piram won the grand annual, and it just kind of built from there. And then we came across, or uh, we didn't come across him, Paul came across, Carlos Star, Big Bucks, Masterminded, Denman, um, and the list goes on. I think Senkos even early on won a Tingle Creek. So the good horses just were in Paul's, and I was lucky enough to be there at the right time. Like th th Those horses might, might have come now, and I could have missed them, um, but they were there when I was there, and I was lucky to ride them. What do you put that down to, Paul? That that golden era. I uh, just lots of things really. Um, it was a lot easier to buy them at that time. I had some good owners who were investing at the time, and we bought well. Anthony Bromley bought all those horses. It was a good team thing, and a lot, a lot of luck as well. A Denman found us, and Strong Flow was one of the first we won the Hennessy with. That was one of the best horses Ruby and I got together with to start with. It just happened. It, it, they were there at the right time and um, it, as Ruby said it goes in cycles and the, the, we had the best horses and the best horses now in Ireland it's just the way it goes and it'll come back again the other way is as it does in any any sport but they were amazing horses and it was just an incredible time and as Ruby said it happened it happened he was there at that time it's all all sort of fell into place for us all at the right time I can remember Francesca coming home from holidays I was in went to Florida for a week with Gillian one day and I landed in Dublin Airport and my phone rang as I'm coming through immigration. And Paul says, look, I want you to come to Kelso. Well, it could have been a Thursday or two days later. Yeah, it was. And I'm, yeah. thinking, I'm thinking, Kelso? In May? So he says, yeah, look, I'm telling you, I want you to come to Kelso. This horse will be in the Hennessy. And I said, all right. Headed off up to Kelso. Road strong flow. He won the length of the straight in Kelso and he won the Hennessy. But like, that was just the quality of horses. That, but that's the foresight too. I'm thinking going to May and Kelso. What is he on about? Mm. But he bolted up. And obviously, he bolted up in the Hennessy. And so when and why did this partnership uh, come to a close? It came to a close for me, really. Um, as you said, it was a lot of to and fro. And I was getting a bit older. And I wanted to get longer out of my career. Um, I wanted, I suppose, I had idolised Richard Dunwoody as a, a young fella. And I realised that when he was getting a bit older, he too slowed things down in order to get as long as he could. No injury prevented him ultimately getting as long out of his career as he wanted. But I wanted to get a bit longer out of mine. And 
to and fro was was the reason I wanted to I wanted to stay in Ireland. It was as simple as that. Uh, it appealed to me all through my twenties, and I loved every day of it. I loved getting up on a Monday morning to fly to Gatwick to ride to and Plumpton to be in Taunton on Tuesday to be in Warwick on Wednesday to be in Torres on Thursday to be back in Sandown Friday. It could be wherever Saturday. I loved it all through my twenties, and um, but eventually as I got older, I was married. We were having children, and I wanted to get as long out of my career as I could, and that's ultimately why it came to an end and it was a an awkward conversation I flew to Bristol and drove to meet Paul and I suspected he knew it was coming what was I doing turned up in Ditch Street in Bristol or in May I'd never been there in May before and here I was turning up in the yard but I wanted to tell him face to face we'd had a very good relationship uh, we were good friends as well as a Boston employee and I wanted to keep it that way so uh, we started on good terms and we finished on good terms or at least I think we did anyway yeah we did yeah was it hard to kind of Regroup and 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 find a new a new stable jockey to to replace the irreplaceable. Um, I, as Ruby said, I knew it was coming to an end. Um, you know, it, it was the end of an era with all those horses. You know, Big Bucks, Corto, them, and Neptune Colange, all those horses. Sarkanda was another one. You know, great horses. They they'd all finished, and we were coming into a new cycle. And obviously, Ruby was you know as he said he started a family, and and I could just I just knew what was what was happening. I knew what he was going to say when he came over pretty well. And, you know, it was always the way it was going to go. And we, as we said, we, we only ever had a sort of gentleman disagreement all the way through. I think we shook our hands at the end of it and ended up friends and always will be. And, you know, it, we just had one of those magical eras. And um, then we just had to, it hasn't been so easy since then to find somebody that fits in with all the owners um, since then. We've had some great jockeys and it's worked out well. But I think with Harry now this year, I don't it's, think it's, it's I fitted in well. with them all either all the time as well. well but but that, 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 would, that would never happen. That would never happen. You can never please everybody. Um, but it's a, it's a lot easier now with Harry, again, as it was. It was, it was the easiest I had anyway. You know, it's funny thing is, you know, I always get a lot of stick for being hard on jockeys and that. But what people don't realise actually at the end of the day is the owners that... Um, line out the bullets we end up having to pull the trigger and, and minding your own job a little bit really and I've had and I suppose in when the early days of your you're not so you don't stand up to people as much as now I would actually stand up and say this is what's happening if you don't like it I'm sorry it doesn't suit our, our setup if you don't want to be part of it go elsewhere but it, you know in back long, I was never brave enough to do that so you end up getting yourself in a bit of a muddle but um you know, it was a, how many years was it 14 15 years of your road for us it was you know it was a it was a good time I, Paul said you were, you were hard on jockeys and I can remember in the beginning thinking Paul would fly off the handle but as I got a bit older I realised that, that was it though when Paul had an issue he had it out and you moved on it wasn't simmering underneath for days and weeks and months he said what was on his chest and then you both knew where you stood and it was almost easier than somebody walking away angry with you not saying it to you and, and penting it up and penting it up I found it as we went on much easier if you just laid it out. Um, look, I apologised more often than not, you were probably wrong anyway. And once you got it off his chest and I apologised, you moved on and that's probably why you didn't fa fall out. But I found it difficult riding with people that weren't happy with you but wouldn't say it to you. Um, I must refer when someone said to you, look, you were wrong there, you should have done this, move on. If someone doesn't give out to you, you can never get any better. I read, Paul, that you um, cited Tidal Bay and the Lexus as one of Ruby's best yeah. rides. Oh, that was awesome that day. You know, I think he jumped the last... <laughs> Last fence in fifth place and got up and won on the line. And that horse had a real... You had to ride him with balls of steel because he, 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 he loved to come with one late run and pass horses. You know, no point going either side. You had to go weave your way through it. And anybody watch that race would have to say that was one of Ruby's finest rides. It was just brilliant. Brilliant horse on his day, but very, very hard to get right and tactically right and get him right. And that day, it, all just, it was just a brilliant, brilliant ride that day. Uh, Funny, that? I'd say, Francesca, Sorry, that sorry. was just that was just perseverance. You kept like you're coming from last and left on your roll in the dice. I'd look back on one more fondly, and that was big bucks and entry over fences. He kept yeah, yeah, kicking true. fences out of the ground. I'd say that was more of a ride. Tidal Bay, you were rolling the dice. If he got up, he got up. If he didn't, that was Tidal Bay. He just didn't get there. Whereas big bucks definitely to me was more challenging than over fences than Tidal Bay was. He was brilliant. Paul went back over hurdles with him then. And like he just became the horse he was, but that took doing too, and that was all Paul's own decision. He didn't ask me whether I thought he should go back jumping hurdles. Maybe he spoke to Clifford. I can't remember who was the assistant at the time. Maybe it was Dan, but was it Dan at the time? No, I think the thing was that uh, I'd worked out in my mind that the only way that uh, um, 
big bucks was going to be successful over fences is if you rode it. And with court, and I remember saying to Andy, there's no way in the world you're going to get off Corto Star to ride big bucks. So we just won't go and spin the dice over hurdles because he's never been a natural jumper. He might just be a staying hurdler and the rest was history. And it was really that was the point that you weren't going to get off Corto to ride him and I knew you needed to be riding him. Not so bad. Walk from me. I got to ride him all. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Must have taken a bit of juggling. What was the masterminded story about being supplemented? I don't know if it was supplemented, but I remember going, walking into the ring and sand down to ride him in a handicap chase in January time, was it? Yeah. I think I was injured. He ran an Exeter, walked into ride him yeah. in a handicap chase and sand down. And Paul said, This will win. And I'm thinking, All right, well, grand, it won. So then we turned up in Newbury um, before the game spirit. And yeah, that's right. Against Voipur Paul, Steadies. Yeah, Voipur Steadies. Paul said he'll win, and I'm telling you, he'll win the champion chase. And at the time, I think Twist Magic could have been favoured for the champion chase. Mm. I was thinking, right, this is bullish. I went out and rode him. He beat Voipur Steadies, and he came back in. He said, I'm telling you, and he'd be £10 better on champion chase there. I said, fair enough. He's only a five-year-old. And I remember talking to Chalk, thinking, because Twist Magic and Voipur Steadies had bounced off each other. And Chalk Thornton was kind of thinking, Phew, I'd prefer the other fella. But I said, Paul is adamant this horse will be better. Brought him in the champion chase and he won a distance. Five-year-old. He won 19 lengths or 24 lengths. Something ridiculous as a five-year-old. But it was the same thing. I don't know. When Paul had those good horses, he'd, he'd tell you weeks before they'd win, they didn't get beat. Take some, some knack. Uh, Paul, I was interested in something you said earlier about um, being answerable to your owners and where when it comes to jockeys, you've, you've learned to kind of um, trust your judgment a bit more. And I'm interested on the subject of female jockeys you've obviously been a massive supporter of Bryony Frost and obviously it's been a massive year for the female jockeys with Brian um mm. with Rachel all those wins at Cheltenham and winning the Grand National um do you think that's still a thing do you think you still have to kind of fight the case for having a female jockey on a horse no I, I've never had to fight for Bryony in that way um I mean she obviously gets on well with some horses particularly well and I've always thought I've had a little bit of a knack of working out the ones that she might be might suit her, that might just perform slightly better for her. Um, and we've got that fairly well at Black Court and Frode on. And those people then, the owners, you know, they ride good winners for uh, like using her. And um, she's done incredibly well. And I've never had any difficulty persuading owners to use there, there are some people just say, I don't want to use Bryony, fine, don't argue with them. But that that goes across the board with all the with all jockeys but it's never an issue you know everybody's only too keen to you know to please the user she gives them a good ride she listens to what i say she's strong um but you know and there are some horses i wouldn't even entertain putting her on um you know big strong heavy horses probably not the ideal thing for her but those horses like frode on blackport and even secret investors she got a tune out of the other day newbury suit her well and you know i try and use that to, uh, to everybody's advantage and um, Ruby, I've heard you saying that that now your your daughters are, are very <laughs> aspiring to be the next Rachel Blackmore. And I've heard you be so um, so positive about the way she rides and so um, so complimentary. Um, she really is a bit of a star, isn't she? But what what do you think in light of her success at Aintree in the Grand National? How much do you think? Um, <clears throat> life has changed for her and how difficult is it going to be for her to manage all the media requests and being in the spotlight whereas I presume she just wants to be left to, to do what she does best which is writing. Yeah but she's she's 31 Francesca she's not 18 she has plenty of life experience behind her and she's a pretty level person so yeah there will be more, more attention now but like everybody in life your phone will eventually stop ringing and people won't be that interested in you at some stage. So, um, and she's well aware of that too. And she will use it to her use it use it to her advantage. But I think it's been a great positive for us. And I mean, there's three national newspapers in Ireland, and on the front page of today's Irish Independent was a young girl called Mia, and I can't remember her second name at the Apprentice School in Ireland. And it's on the front page of the Irish Independent is a picture of Mia, and I, her second name escapes me in the apprentice school in Ireland wanting to be the next race of Blackmore. I mean, how often does racing on a non-racing day get onto the front page of one of the daily papers? And that's because of what Rachel Blackmore has done. And I think that is hugely positive for racing. And do you think she has a, 
um, a responsibility to do loads of press to be seen? No, out no, I don't. Places, she, or do you no. think she can just put her head down and keep riding? Her responsibility is as a sports person, is as a jockey. Um, and that's to perform to her best as, as she can while she's riding the horses and let the results do the talking for them. No, she doesn't have any responsibility to promote racing. There's enough of people employed within the sport. Uh, you have GBR Racing in Ireland, HRI have a whole PR wing of their own. It's their job to promote the racing, not actual people who are trying to earn a living out of it. They can do their best and do a bit here and there. But I think uh, trying to tell somebody it's your responsibility for, to promote the game. I think the best way you can promote it for her is riding winners. For Paul Nichols, it was training the winners. Um, it's results that ultimately promote you. Well, it's been um, it's been fascinating chatting to you guys. Um, I think we might have a bit of a Q and A session. We've had uh, some questions come in on the right hand side here in the in the chat section. Um, ooh, I'm going to pick a few at random here. Paul, this is from James. You say it will come back. Uh, and with the greatest respect, what are you doing, the other English trainers, to bring that back? Please read this as constructive and not abusive. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's just just buying the right ammunition. As simple as that. It's having the right horses. Um, I've been buying some nice horses in France recently. My close to deal on a very nice one today. Um, it's just getting the ammunition. And we, we did it before and we'll do it again. But I feel like you and Ruby take this uh, at slightly different angles because Ruby, I heard you saying that it's all about prize money. The prize money in Ireland is yeah, so superior yeah. to England. But Paul, you say that's not such a relevant argument. Of course it is. And, and I, I think uh, prize money is a big issue. Um, it is also a, a big hobby for a lot of people. That's the thing. A lot of guys have got a lot of money to spend, big business and work hard. It is, it is their hobby and they enjoy it as, as well. Prize money is a big issue and it, it's got to come back in the UK. And already there's a big announcement tonight for Mark that the first Chepstone meet in the prize money is having a huge boost um, next season. If that goes across the board and that's the start of it, that's a, that is a plus. But, you know, to, we're not going to win those big races and get back to where we are without having, having the horses and just getting the horses. And, um, you know, I've got plenty of enthusiastic owners will will be doing their very best to try and buy the best horses and just, it just hasn't worked out the last few years that, 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 that we have. But we're saying that, you know, it's not as bad as it looks. And not as, it's, I think it's all been over-exaggerated, to be honest with you. OK, we didn't have a winner at Cheltenham, but I think for the last 20-odd years we've had, and we've had 46 winners at Cheltenham, and it'll be back again, you know. Cheltenham's not the be-all and end of everything. You know, we, we want to win races across 12 months of the year and try and win all those big races across the... Whether it's Cheltenham, Aintree, Kempton, Newbury, Kelso, Air. We want to win the big races, and we just got to get the horses. Ruby, do you think that it'll the momentum will swing back? Of course, it will. It always does. Um, but look, there's no one invested in national hunt racing who isn't in it as a hobby, and I don't think any of the big national hunt owners ever expect to have their investment returned because it's just not going to happen. But I do think if you can at least subsidise the training costs and the expenses it does make it easier for them to invest. And I think that was my point about the, the prize money Francesca being more substantial in Ireland, that owners with the numbers of horses. And even my wife was involved in, in, the, in a syndicate and, you know, prize money covers the running costs. And it is as easy to get people to in, invest a few quid they've saved, providing it's not costing much more. After, sorry, providing it's not costing much more after that. Um, but when training fees and travelling expenses and all those things add up and you're winning but it's not paying for it it does make it slightly frustrating when it's supposed to be a hobby and the money the money can be generated it can be there but English racing will always need Irish participation like Irish racing will always need English participation and for Paul to be bringing Clandis Oba to Punchestown next week Dan bringing Noob Negre Kim Bailey bringing First Flow they all add to the race meetings and both countries will always need each other and therefore, the, not the programmes, but the daily racing should be intertwined because it all generates income for everybody. It's, it's a massive subject, isn't it? My, my dad's on the board of the, of the BHA and I regularly uh, talk to him about the, the woes of British racing. But I think we might lose a few people if we go too deeply into that. Um, I, there's been quite a few requests for, for horses to look out for. Um, Ruby, you first. 
Um, horses to look out for. Winners, God. Um, <laughs> winners. Uh, well, look, the season ends obviously on Saturday in the UK and it ends next Saturday in Ireland. Um, and I think early in May, Willie will run a couple of nice maidens, one called Tax for Max, one called Far Out. Um, you can keep an eye on both of them. They'll both be, both be winning maiden hurdles fairly quickly in early May. I'm guessing you've got an eye on the flat as well. Can you give me the two guineas? I think right, no, uh, the guineas winners, um, Battleground was drifting in, 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 in markedly. I was doing a podcast last week. He was my idea of the two thousand idea of the two thousand guineas winner all year. So I ran incredibly at the Breeders' Cup after missing the break, and I loved him as a two year old. Um, in the Phillies race, it depends on the weather. Um, I think it revolves around the two Phillies. Uh, Joseph's Philly pretty pretty gorgeous, and Dunnick is Shale. Um, slow ground suits pretty gorgeous. Quick ground shoots suits Shale. So depending on the weather, I think either of those. Keeping Santa Barbara out of it. Look, she won a maiden um, and she's been backed off the boards, but we've seen an awful lot more the other two and I'm afraid I don't have a, a spy in Bally Doyle and I haven't been watching their galloping, so um, <laughs> Santa Barbara means very little to me, unfortunately. Um, sorry, I've diverted onto the flat. Uh, back to the jumps. Paul Nichols, ones to look out for, please. Uh, God. I mean, of the horses that run this season, you've obviously got to follow Mum Morale. Um, He's a gorgeous horse. He won all five of his starts. Ended up winning the Grade One entry. He's a lovely horse. Um, and one to, to be winning the start of the new season in a maiden hurdle will be a horse called Paso Doble. He was third on his debut in the Adonis at Kempton in a good race. He's improved since then, and I'd like to win a maiden hurdle with him in May before we turn him away. But he'd be an exciting horse for next season. Paso Doble. Paso Doble. Um, <clears throat> who's the best jockey riding at the moment in the UK? To everyone. Um, well, Harry Skelton's going to be champion jockey. and yeah. He's had an incredible season. Um, that depends on your, t- your taste, Francesca. Yeah. Um, Harry Brian Hughes is a very good rider. Harry Cobden. Um, Sam Twist and Davis. There's no shortage of good riders. Maybe what they're all lacking is some very good horses, but there are some very good riders. And I would agree with Paul. I love that Mon Morale. Um, I watched, I still lucky enough to see him live in Edge. It was the first time I saw him in front of me. And um, yeah, he looks a bit different. Anyone else? Thoughts on top jocks? Uh, as we said, I mean, there's some great jockeys in this country and a lot of them would be like to be riding big yards and riding good horses. Um, you know, Harry Scalton's obviously a champion jockey. He's done incredibly well. Harry Cobden has done particularly well. Brian Hughes as as well, and there's lots of good young jockeys coming on through that will do very well. So we're not short of good jockeys in this country. I find that really interesting on the <clears throat> in the national hunt. Sorry, <clears throat> probably a bit different to the flat. How you can have uh, what last year's champion jockey Brian Hughes being champion jockey and hardly getting a ride at the Cheltenham Festival. I guess it's very uh, stable relationship dependent, isn't it? It's not that different to the flat, Francesca. Um, Sylvester de Souza. Um, who was champion jockey in the flat last year? It was Jim Crowley was before he got the hand of Al McToom job. Since he got that job, he hasn't yeah. been champion jockey. Uh, Oshin Murphy was the first jockey with a job, obviously for Sheikh Fad. But before that, on the flat, it had gone to the guys who were prepared to travel and ride more rather than the guys who were riding the group home winners. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. I wouldn't think it's that different, to tell you the truth. Yeah, I still think the, 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 the best available will still get rides at Royal Ascot It'd be unusual for them not to be at Royal Ascot in a week where they think they can get more rides. Yeah, but if you want to partake or do you want to win? Yeah, true. Right, moving on. Uh, what is your pet hate, Paul Nichols? Um, a pet, I don't know. pet hate. Is pet one hate of my pet hate people being late? Yeah, <laughs> there we are. <laughs> yeah. There we are. Anyone else got an interesting pet hate? Harry, what's yours? <laughs> yeah, I, I spent too much time with him. I hate people being late. Or de-icing the roads in the winter. Yeah, yeah that's, just, well. that's just a fact Quite of the life. job. That has to be done. But people being late to de-ice the roads would annoy me. <laughs> really? Have you got one? Yeah, I hate the cold. I don't mind how much rain falls. I hate the cold. Really? Do you not spend yeah. your life outside? I do. Cold? I do. I hate it. I swear. I swear to God. Even when I was riding, I would need six or seven pounds to get through on a light ride because I couldn't go out with nothing on me, with like just colours in the back protector. I had to, and I would often be shivering in the pedring. I hate the cold. 
That's hilarious. Wow. I would never... I, I, for, I'll tell you a funny story there. Once Ruby came into the paddock to, to ride Core cool Two Star somewhere and he was shaking like he just said, I've just remembered this is gospel truth. And Clyde Smith said to me, why is Ruby shaking? Is he nervous? I said, nervous, he's bloody cold. <laughs> he was literally shaking like that. <laughs> a true story, that is. Did you not go and get in the sauna before coming out? Uh, I mean, probably after it? having... They probably have to have two rides. Probably in Kempton, it was probably minus bloody three as it was. Um, well, just riding, about thawed out. Eventually, it would. You wouldn't get too warm riding Cardo Star. I never come off the bridle, most of us. <laughs> oh, I like that. Um, oh, do I detect a sense of pride from Paul in Mr. Derham? Oh, bless. Well, you're bound to be proud of your nephew. You know, he's part of the family, he's doing a good job. Um, and um, you know, if he's champion trainer one day in the future, and I don't know, thirty years time or something like that, and I'll be proud of him. <laughs> thirty years time, <laughs> I like that. Um, the question about how much does racing affect your private life, family life? Because presumably, well, I know having grown up in a in a racing family, it is all encompassing. Um, how much? Yeah, how much does it have an effect on other areas of your life? I'd say it's no different to farming myself. Farming. <laughs> any, 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 any job that involves livestock, um, animals, is seven days a week, three hundred and sixty-five days a year. Would you Amazing not say it's like, no except a farmer has a farmer hasn't got to deal with three hundred owners. He can go yeah, and have a cup of tea and shut the door. You're a trainer, but I, yeah. I, I was never I was never a trainer. Um no. I was a tra- I was a trainer's son and I was brought up in a yard and I would say it is that's what it is and you know what you're getting into. Um it is just every day of the year, all day, every day of the year. Although I'd say different to farming because yes, it is time consuming, but be it a jockey or a trainer, you're very much um reliant on your results how many winners you've ridden how many horses you wish had won or that didn't win whereas a farmer it's slightly less it's still farmer. results really, really it is it is you start you've bad grass and you've got bad milk who wants to buy it off you then the cheese is crap then a barber can't buy any horses to put in trend with Paul Nichols and it all yeah. falls down so <laughs> the less kind of day to day like how often did you go home with you like with a with your lip on the ground because you got beaten where you thought you should have won and how much does that affect family life? How many fellas test cattle and have TB and walk around with their tea and walk around with their lip on the ground? <laughs> it's, it's the same thing. Right, okay. I don't think I'm going to win. Basically, it. the answer it's, it's to not, that question it, is getting the balance right. Okay. I'm trying to get the that? balance right. How do you well, do that? Well, it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> Don't ask me, because I got whenever, it wrong many a time. <laughs> when you figure it out, let me know, will you? Yeah, and me. <laughs> okay, so it's difficult. Put it that way, if you want to be really successful in your field and have everything else uh, balanced as well. Right, um, Ed, <laughs> I think it's time for you to step back in and, and, and round things off for us. Um, well, that, <laughs> that was great. Uh, um, thank you very much. We, we overran because you're sort of pub chat just went on and on and it, I, know, I, sorry. I didn't want to stop it for a second um uh paul nichols ruby walsh uh, uh, harry Derham, francis kamani thank you so much uh, um I, I sat here watching this i appeared on your screens with the view that it was gonna sort of you know i'm gonna wrap it up about you know no no, no but in a nice way about 15 minutes ago uh, um and your chat was just so good and I, I thought if i just delete myself it's gonna look even weirder so i just sort of <laughs> tried to pull nice faces and um guys i really can't thank you enough it was properly fascinating and and really really interesting um all the people watching are about 790 i don't know there are some of you there. thank you so much <laughs> for watching uh, um and um and um, the best of luck on Saturday, Paul, just finishing off this season. Um, and, um, and we will reconvene very soon. Um, thank you, everybody. And particularly thank you to JM Finn for, um, uh, uh, for sponsoring us for all the stuff that we did. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank Good you. Night. Cheers. Bye-bye. You don't. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.